We have gazed upon the moon with wonder since the dawn of humanity and named its craters as seas, but could those become true seas one day? Welcome to Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, and I am your aforementioned host, Isaac Arthur. Today we will be discussing if it could ever be possible, let alone practical, to terraform the moon, to give it seas and sky, and make it a beautiful blue and green gem in our sky. The simple answer is yes, it can be done, though it is a monumental task, and how practical it is would depend a lot on both your available technologies and how badly we want to do it. Today we'll be discussing several different approaches and what is involved in each. But let's begin by laying out some basic principles of terraforming, the main hurdles to doing it to the moon, and the advantages it has, and some misconceptions involved. First, there's two basic camps of terraforming, which are meant to make them more Earth-like, and that's terraforming and para-terraforming. There's no truly distinct line between the two, but para-terraforming tends to manifest in options like a dome on a planet full of pressurized and breathable air or artificial lighting to match Earth's sunlight duration and spectrum. There's also bioforming, which is when you alter organisms to fit an alien environment. You might adjust everything's biology to be content with a 27 hour day on one planet, or more overtly, give humans and other mammals gills so they could live on a water planet. With very few exceptions, we should assume all of humanity's efforts off of Earth will use a mix of all three options both over the course of the endeavor and in the final product. Even on Earth we may opt to pair terraform our tundras or deserts, and exact matches for Earth should be rare in the galaxy. In nearly every case you have the ability to use one of those options far more heavily than the others if you prefer that approach. For bioforming, you can probably cook up some form of life that can live on a radiation-scorched airless vacuum with sufficient effort. Even it means a total overhaul of everything to use silicon based life in place of carbon. You can get very heavy handed with terraforming to take a planet with a 27 hour day and slow its rotation to 24 by extreme efforts. For pair terraforming, we tend to view this as the active use of technologies to replicate Earth like living conditions. You might alter daylight by use of orbiting mirrors and shades, or gravity by centrifugal force. An extreme version of that might be creating an incredibly elaborate virtual world like in the Matrix on some barren rock and plugging everyone there into it while covering the rock in power collectors and robotic factories. In all of these cases, there's likely to be a sweet spot for each planetary setup that varies by what the colonists want and what their technologies make most economical or practical, and that is likely to change with time. For instance, there are something like a million planets in just the solar system. The eight we talk about that no longer includes Pluto are the major planets, and that's basically the objects more massive than our moon. Pluto is smaller and less massive than our moon. There are a couple other moons bigger and more massive than our moon too, but there are probably a hundred dwarf planets akin to Pluto kicking around the outer solar system and millions of minor planets, a large portion of which are asteroids. In a future solar empire, every last one of these will be pair terraformed in some fashion and Earth will stand as the crown jewel, hub of trade and knowledge. This will likely continue even as we expand out into billions of stars in this galaxy, because almost every colony among the stars will maintain some sort of lifeline with Earth. They would bring a lot of practical experience and knowledge about how to make dead rocks livable and a lot of industrial might and manpower to the interplanetary economy. Terraforming options will be very dependent on the resources you can commit to the project, If the moon is the brightest jewel in the heavens next to Earth, itself the center of a powerful empire or confederacy of growing worlds, then the sheer amount of muscle they can throw at the moon is almost unimaginable. In the meantime, no place is closer to us and easier for us to exert efforts on. We can get stuff to the moon much easier than Mars or Venus. That includes signals, as signal lag from the moon is only a bit over a second each way not many minutes like in our inner solar system, hours for the outer system, or years to neighboring stars. That means you can run robots on the moon controlled by people here on Earth, and while more advanced AI seems certain in the future, one's able to work fairly autonomously even if we limit it to very subhuman intelligence, 
The sheer advantage of a more automated industrial base makes everything about space travel and development enormously easier and gives you a large amount of resources to throw at projects. The Moon's proximity to Earth and its low gravity also makes it our natural force base to launch not just interplanetary colonization, but to build up efforts in Earth orbital space, as bulk raw materials and fuel can be gotten off the Moon for just a few percent of the energy cost of getting off Earth with its thick atmosphere and high gravity. For this reason, the Moon is likely to be heavily mined and home to a lot of manufacturing for the buildup of space, and thus is likely to eventually have a lot of muscle to turn efforts to improving its own livability long before a place like Mars might. Indeed, I would go so far as to argue the Moon will be the first place we terraform, even if it might be a more heavy case of pair terraforming and thus might not be the first place to decently approximate a naturally livable planet. Though again, unless we find some decent twin to Earth in a neighboring solar system, every other candidate would also need a lot of pair terraforming, with Venus maybe being the easiest, not Mars. This hardly makes it easy and we should begin the major challenges for terraforming the Moon by mentioning that it also has an advantage. The Moon is one of the few objects that gets Earth parallel levels of sunlight. Mercury, Venus, and the Atan asteroid group get more or equal lighting, but most objects are further away, at least for most of their orbits. As such, the Moon is not just a place where solar power is practical, but which needs no more filtering of sunlight than our own atmosphere provides us. However, nice as that is, there's two problems with that lighting. First, that filtering our atmosphere does is hardly trivial. If our air suddenly became transparent to all that ultraviolet light and ionizing radiation, we would be burned badly. Second, the sun rises and sets on Earth and the Moon both. There is no dark side to the Moon, except in the sense of the back side of it being invisible to us here on Earth. The Moon orbits the Earth and always shows it the same face, and it does this once a month, so that's how long its day is too. For the sake of discussion, yes, it would be possible to unglue the Moon from its tidal locking with Earth, and if it were terraformed with seas and sky, they would act like a lubricant against tidal breaking, cutting down on how much effort had to be exerted to keep the Moon at a 24-hour day. The rotational energy of a sphere rises approximately with the square of its angular velocity. If you want to spin the Moon almost 30 times faster so it rotated every day, you are talking nearly a thousand times the rotational energy it has now, but it's actually very tiny compared to Earth's. It's around 3 times 10 to the 23rd joules, whereas Earth's is almost a million times higher. So even spun at Earth's rate of once a day, its far lower mass and radius means it would only need a thousandth of the energy Earth did. And indeed that once a day Moon's rotational energy would be a little under the amount the Sun produces every second, and only a small fraction of the sunlight hitting the Moon during a period it would need for the tidal locking to reoccur if left to its own devices. So keeping the Moon spinning once per day is entirely doable. This is arguably still terraforming since it would require continuous technological effort to keep it from slowing down, as opposed to simply putting various mirrors and shades in a 24-hour orbit of the Moon. I think we need to acknowledge a conceptual difference with terraforming though, with the idea that terraforming is where things are more immediately vulnerable to breakdown. A fleet could come by and wipe out those orbital mirrors and shades, as could some Kessler Syndrome event of cascade collisions of orbital junk. Neither would be likely to spin a planet or moon back down again to a lower rotation. While paraterraforming efforts might need regular maintenance, a breakdown of civilization for a century or two after some collapse of an empire or disaster isn't going to result in the planet deterraforming. This is obviously a very grey and somewhat arbitrary distinction too, but I think a degree of vulnerability or time sensitivity is implied with pair terraforming and that its absence tends to be where we consider it more in the line of terraforming. So could we spin the moon up? Yes, and we might too. We could do the same with Venus, to give it a day length like Earth's instead of its backward day-night cycle longer than its own year, but since Venus is nearly as massive and wide as Earth, we would need to give almost three quarters Earth's rotational energy to match our day. Alternatively, Mars, at a tenth our mass and half our radius, would have only a fortieth Earth's rotational energy for the same day length, and already has one only about half an hour longer, so it already has about 95% of that energy. 
For Mars, we might add to its rate of spin and angular momentum by dropping comets onto it to bring it valuable volatiles like water, ammonia, and methane. It would not be hard to coordinate all your incoming drops of those to add angular momentum to Mars. That's no small task, but if you plan to add those to Mars, you might as well do it that way and get the free rotational bump. Especially since dropping an object onto it to add spin means it impacts a slightly lower velocity, since it's coming in near the equator and in the direction of existing spin. Less crash damage. Doing it the other way around, to subtract spin, would produce stronger impacts. But you can also magnetically drain a planet's rotation as a power source by building a planet-sized dynamo around the planet. You can add spin that way too, but must pay energy in. You also have the option of launching material off a planet or moon and using that momentum to shove your planet's rotation up or down. When we think of exporting large amounts of raw material off the moon, or Venus for that matter, we can not imagine a large mass driver or space catapult that launched so as to add or subtract spin. Two opposing launchers could ensure that spin remained the same, adding when one launched and subtracting when the other did, so you could get a body to the right spin then keep it there. A directed energy beam from the sun could do it too, though radiant pressure alone is not your best option. A beam of ionized particles or concentrated solar wind isn't a great thing to hurl at a planet with an atmosphere you want to keep, either, but would also work on an initially airless planet. You could build big towers up into space with giant reflectors on them, or deflecting magnets, it's quite easy to do without any gravity or air constraints, and you use them like a big solar windmill to spin the moon, or any other body for that matter. However, I think you would opt for timing your landings and launches so they added inertia. A big mining hub like the moon in an automated Karshev scale civilization might be belching out entire megatons of matter every moment at interplanetary speeds, while receiving large amounts of other materials, which is a lot of inertia changing hands. In any event, the key notion there is that you are likely to try to piggyback a lot of terraforming operations onto existing projects to save effort. I would not be surprised if we saw rotational changes done while terraforming planets, and you might piggyback out the pair terraforming effort too. Our vastly cheaper alternative to spin a planet, at least in the short term, is erecting a big solar shade and mirrors to keep the normal sunlight off the planet and bounce it down a proper 24 hour pattern. This is ideal for a place like Venus, as we can then cool it down over a couple of centuries and make it livable and use mirrors to bring in a 24 hour day at Earth level of intensity and warmth. You can make them wavelength selective too, this lets you add more light of a given wavelength to a planet for other stars than our own, or to remove most of the harmful ultraviolet light. Given that such shades and mirrors need to only be a few micrometers thick, even though they must have a combined surface area similar to the planet or moon they are on, this is not a big investment of mass. Over time they may become a hassle to repair and replace and be viewed as not as good as the real thing, in which case such shades might be large power collectors and you could beam the energy down to the planet as a power source for the people industries below. A shade like that would represent a huge amount of power and a constant one, there's no nighttime or weather at some planet's L1 Lagrange point, so you could use your surplus power as your civilization grew or from outside your peak hours to help spin that planet up, and when you get there you just recycle your orbital shades and mirrors and enjoy a natural day, or most of them anyway. This sort of orbital infrastructure is likely to be a common feature on any planet or moon we settle on as it has so many advantages and is relatively cheap to deploy. It's also a bit trickier on a moon than a planet since the moon's own L1 Lagrange point is with Earth not the Sun, and the same for its L2 so you need to orbit them around the moon at a radius of 6,000 miles or 10,000 kilometers for a period of one day. You would likely use the same big thin sheets for mirrors and shades and just give them some internal power collectors and gyros so they could rotate themselves to either bounce light away from the moon or add light to it, and they'd spin to reflect light away when between the moon and sun. This amounts to building a micro Dyson swarm around the moon to keep light out, and I suspect you would instead try for an orbital ring around the moon that just had a big opaque circular shade on it moving to interpose with the sun, and a similar approach is probably a good pick for Mercury due to its decidedly strange days. You just open or close your sunshade or mirror on that ring to the amount needed to match what you want. 
This is a decidedly clunky approach though, and combined with a vastly lower energy requirement to achieve proper spin is why I think we might see that brute force rotation adjustment occur, which would make for some impressive tides once we got air and water in place, as Earth would cause a lot more tidal warping on the Moon than the Moon does to us, which is why it's tidally locked in the first place. We obviously haven't got time today to run through all of our options for terraforming in the same length, but this topic is one we have tended to skim over in our other terraforming videos like planetary terraforming techniques, and I think it applies more to the Moon. Alternatively, we devote an entire episode to getting a magnetosphere around Mars, which is much easier than folks tend to assume and doesn't involve nuking its core, and the same option can be applied to our Moon. But it brings up other challenges for terraforming the Moon, and that's the issue that things aren't very heavy on the Moon because of its low gravity, and the combined with its lack of magnetosphere makes giving an atmosphere very hard, or rather having it keep an atmosphere once put on. If we just opened a magic wormhole to the Moon and dumped an atmosphere on it, it would not instantly fly off, but the leakage would be awful. We cannot model that well enough to give useful figures, but while it might be several lifetimes before any appreciable drop occurred, it wouldn't be the same geologically long process it was on Mars of a few hundred million years. And if you spent a thousand years shipping in an atmosphere, and have to replace your atmosphere every several million years, then that just means you went from having 10,000 megafreighters dropping air off every month to just one swinging by to replenish minuscule losses. Alternatively, if you need to replenish it on timelines of centuries, I think that becomes unsustainable, and we don't know what that timeline would look like for a terraformed moon. It also represents a lot of air, as you need more air over any given area on a lower gravity planet than on Earth, because the lower gravity makes the same amount of air have less weight and generate less pressure down on the surface. You get a very tall atmosphere as a result, and a thicker one in terms of there being much more air above you which would change the visual properties of the sky, particularly near dawn and dusk. Now the reality is this atmospheric loss issue is a hard problem to solve, there are several mechanisms for atmospheric loss and they all happen faster when you have lower gravity or hotter or have no magnetosphere protecting you. The Moon has lower gravity than Mars, is closer to the Sun than Mars, and it shines on spots for two weeks straight to further heat things and has no magnetosphere of note. The easy paraterraforming fix is basically to dome over everything. As we recently saw in our episode The Domes of Mars, it is indeed possible to build diamond hard domes, diamond is just carbon after all, with multiple panes that are crystal clear, filter out harmful sunlight, and help protect against micrometeors. You could make them sturdier than the steel armor on a battleship if you wanted, and in that episode we detailed a number of backup and emergency protocols to make a dome a safer place to live than under an open sky, which is part of the problem, I'm not sure you would ever not have those domes up given the advantages they have if big and crystal clear. Indeed, so long as they are tall enough to hold any normal atmosphere depth so that the pressure was much lower near the top, you would not only still get weather but have very slow leakage out of a given dome even if a huge hole was punctured into it. The Moon's low gravity is still a good deal higher than what is needed to hold particles of air moving at room temperature velocities. That's generally a few hundred meters per second, and the escape velocity of the Moon is around 2400 meters per second. Some particles will move faster than that, but the distribution of speeds falls off very sharply, especially for heavier molecules like nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and carbon dioxide. What's mostly going to strip them off is high speed ions, typically a hydrogen atom or lone proton from the Sun, ramming them at roughly a million miles per hour, which is not hyperbole. A strong magnetic field bends most of those out away from a planet or moon and prevents all those collisions and thus is even more important than gravity for hoarding atmospheres. Again see that episode about making a magnetosphere for Mars for details on how, though there we recommend deploying a solar powered magnet at the Martian L1 with the Sun and have the same problem as solar shades for applying this to a moon, you would probably use the alternative approach of a large orbital ring to generate a magnetic field which could also serve as a useful landing and launch platform, it would be a lot less visually intrusive than the solar shade and mirror approach too. I am generally of the opinion that an artificial magnetosphere would be installed almost everywhere we settled too, and even Earth might deploy one just to further cut down on the ionized particles coming in, which represent dangerous radiation to those on space stations or ships. 
This is a pair of terraforming option, and one where if it breaks down you aren't in immediate danger, so not a jugular vein option, and neither are very tall and strong domes on the moon, which if nice and clear don't represent any sort of visually unpleasant effect. I suspect that even with a magnetosphere and an economy able to import air to replace that loss by slower leakage, you might still have those domes up. I think it would come down to the net leakage rate and if the cost of replacing that was higher than maintaining domes. You would likely keep that artificial magnetosphere anyway. This would minimize energetic particles hitting your domes which would cut down on their own wear and tear and cut down on losses from cracked or leaking domes. You would probably have a very thin atmosphere above the domes anyway just from leakage. This also means if you have short domes, which get all their pressure from being a sealed container stuffed with air rather than by weight of air like on Earth, that when cracks or ruptures do occur, your air spilling out is not being stripped off by solar wind very quickly and can be recovered from this over the dome atmosphere and pumped back down into the domes. But that circumvents the gravity issue a bit, which is our last big problem. As we discussed in Moon Mega City, if we could develop the ability to artificially create black holes, then you could stick one in the center of any body, be it an asteroid or a modest planet like Mars, and pump hydrogen and helium into that to generate power and add mass. You just surround it with a shell so your black hole is separate. You can also skip on doing this at the core in favor of placing many of them at a shallower depth in a grid around the planet or moon. We discussed black hole tech more last week, and again, Moon Mega City covers your gravity options in more detail. As noted there, if you wanted full Earth-like gravity on the Moon, which has 7.4% of Earth's surface area, you would need 7.4% of Earth's mass, and the Moon only has 1.2% of Earth's mass, so you would need to add 6.2% to it, roughly 5 times what it has now. That's a lot of hydrogen and helium to ship in from Jupiter, but it isn't even a thousandth of Jupiter's mass. And we might do this to Jupiter's four big Galilean moons, which are all comparable to our moon in size, and much closer to Jupiter for shipping purposes. Adding mass to the moon would also raise tides on Earth, though at the level of planetary engineering we're discussing, the increased erosion on Earth from that would be minuscule to correct for compared to everything else. This obviously would help a lot for maintaining an atmosphere and one more like Earth's, But if you are using domes and artificial magnetospheres, this question comes down to whether or not lower gravity is biologically adaptable. If it is, I suspect you don't try messing with the moon's mass. We know zero gravity is bad for our health. We have no idea what lower gravity does and how much is enough, but we tend to assume the moon's gravity isn't optimal for our health or those of other terrestrial flora and fauna, though that low gravity might make for some trees so tall that they laughed at redwoods. This is an example where we just don't know yet. You will likely see a large change in how ecosystems work in low gravity though, see our Life on Low Gravity Planets episode for discussion of that, but as a simple example, ecological balances might shift a lot if your trees are taller and flying is easier, and indeed running changes in low gravity too, as each springing step takes you longer to lower your foot down to the ground for the next one. So a given predator-prey relationship might change massively and disrupt ecologies you're trying to put in place. This is where bioforming might be a better option than paraterraforming or even terraforming options. You genetically tweak organisms to better handle lower gravity and rebalance your ecosystems. As we mentioned, it is likely that every place we settle will have its own unique blend of terraforming, bioforming, and paraterraforming that it uses, and which might change at any time. A given planet or moon might not have a unified government able to make policy decisions on terraforming, and that's why paraterraforming will often work better. It's a lot harder to complain if one of your countries on your planet is using domes than it is to if they are mass altering genetics or bringing in tons of cometary bodies or putting a black hole in your planet. And my assumption is that by the time most larger bodies like the Moon, Mars, or Venus have enough people to justify a planet-wide terraforming operation rather than habitation domes and their parallels, that they will also have developed multiple governments, be they sovereign or simply large subdivisions with different opinions than their neighbors on where their planet or moon should go. That time, intent, and willpower equation is the last big aspect of terraforming as while it might seem like a monumental task to bring in a quadrillion tons of nitrogen from Venus or the outer solar system, and many times that in water or hydrogen makes seas, 
It is in some ways easier to ship that than to decide to keep doing it. If I need to bring in 100 quadrillion tons of water to give the moon nice deep seas in those craters, then that's something like a trillion oil tanker deliveries of water or ice. And if you had one arriving every single second of every single day, that's about 30,000 years worth of deliveries. All while the folks who might have been building their homes and towns in those craters might be having second thoughts about how much you really need a sea there and if it really needs to be full depth. Though with Earth hanging huge in their sky, far larger than the Moon is in our sky, they might have that as a constant reminder of what terraforming success looks like. It is a long-term project, but in a civilization in which mass automation makes mega-projects viable and which would likely see the Moon second in power and influence in the interplanetary system era only to Earth, I think the resources would be there. Indeed you might maintain willpower simply because radical life extension technology might make it so people survived from the early days who still dreamed of completing the project, while others might be quite used to lower gravity and the monochrome wasteland beyond the domes and prefer dwelling underground anyway. They might object to terraforming further. Later generations might push the project once more and seek to terraform the moon after a pause. Inevitably, the question comes down to how Earth-like you want your new home to be, and how Earth-like your descendants want it to be when it's been made more habitable but they have adjusted too. Time will tell where the happy medium lies. The political landscape of those descendants will shift as the physical landscape shifts. It will also shift with the capabilities of technology to reshape a world, and the balance point of practical and possible with all helping determine the fate of our moon and of all those other worlds we come to. But we saw today the many ways the moon might be terraformed, so we know it can be done. And for my part, I think a day will come on Earth when we look up at the moon in the sky and see another sky of white clouds over blue seas and green lands. We were discussing the differences between terraforming and paraterraforming today, and part of that line between them is their susceptibility to damage from poor maintenance, sabotage, or attack, and we're seeing more and more these days how vulnerable our infrastructure is to cyber attacks and ransomware. This is almost always preventable, and in most cases just using two-factor authentication, not repeating passwords, and using virtual private networks like NordVPN will keep you safe. NordVPN lets you surf anonymously from many different secure servers around the world while maintaining high speed performance. You have every right to your privacy, websites are not entitled to know your data without even asking, many sell it and even good actors can get hacked, and your data with them, exposing you to attack and fraud. Let NordVPN be your first line of defense, Try out their fast, easy to use, and intuitive interface that you can test out today with a 30 day money back guarantee at nordvpn.com slash IsaacArthur. One of NordVPN's best features though is NordVPN proxy extensions that lets you easily control which sites you visit with or without the VPN on, split tunneling, so you can log into your bank with your real IP while going to other websites with the IP of the VPN server you're using and you can set up different VPN servers on different browsers, including loaned and borrowed devices. Use the web safer and hassle-free with NordVPN. Go to nordvpn.com slash IsaacArthur and try it out risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So that wraps us up for today, but we have a bonus episode this weekend, Sunday, February 25th, on the topic of vacuum trains and other hyperfast transit systems. Next week we'll be finishing the month on February 29th as we leap into the topic of life on a colony arc ship carrying people to new worlds that will carry us ahead into this leap year and into March, where we'll head back to the dot of time for a look at primordial planets. Then we'll continue our discussion of terraforming by asking if it is ethical and when, and what sort of challenges future civilizations will face on deciding whether or not a planet should be terraformed and to what degree. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you'd like to donate or help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, along with hours of bonus content like Topopolis, The Eternal River, at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.